How did you end that? Nice seeing you connected. Come on, you. Nice seeing you connected. Okay, just a second. Okay, uh, thank you for connecting. Nice to see uh, Janice, you, uh, Jayanta. So uh, today's uh, lecture will be presented by co-teacher of this uh, course, Professor Svetlana Kilina from uh, NDSU. Some of you uh, know her, some of, some of you um, uh, will have experience interacting with, with her in other courses. So um, uh, next, Wednesday, there will be presentations by attendees of the class. Please send drafts of the slides uh, no later than uh, midnight of Tuesday. And from now on, the floor is uh, uh, with Professor Svetlana Kivina, 
she will present a lecture and uh, practical instructions and I will be assisting in in second part uh, after after the lecture okay professor Kilian, the floor is yours yeah hi guys unfortunately I cannot see you um, I hope you can hear me so Dmitry was already discussing the importance of using the methodology, choice of the methodology for predicting electronic properties. And you were talking about hartley fock approximation. Uh, you probably have heard about density functional theory approximation. There's also bian hartley fock methods, which is not DFT, but bian hartley fock or accurate than hartley fock um, So all these methods will result on either more accurate or less accurate predictions of the band gap or the semiconductors or electron level splittings in different materials uh, also will be resulting on uh, different values for the energy of the first excited state, second excited state and so on, or for the emission properties, which then you can compare to experimental data. In addition to methodology or part of the methodology is also the discussion of the basis set. This discussion usually holds independent on which methodology you're talking about, whether you use Hartley fork or DFT or Bian Hartley fork methods, uh, if it is quantum or semi empirical methods, if it is quantum type calculations based on the approximations which you are doing to solve the Schrodinger equation for many electron system, then the basis set, the choice of the basis set is one of the procedures, the main step, the main procedure you are using for doing these calculations. And today we will talk about what this means, basis sets, how they are different, uh, and specifically the difference between atom centers or localized basis sets versus uh, not localized basis set, plain wave basis set, and some notification jargon, the language which used to specify the, the basis set, which is really important to know when you do calculations. At least you should know, okay, when I'm doing the calculations, what would be my choice of the basis set? Is it this or that or that? Because uh, many different choices are available and you need at least to understand at some basic idea and some basic level um, which basis set to choose more or less accurate. So this discussion we will do today. And then you will practice with different functions or with different basis sets to see how this affects the uh, bond length, the geometry, for simple small molecules, diatomic molecule, and how this changes the uh, also bond energy. We can also take a look, of course, on the energy splitting of the diatomic molecules, how this is changed with the basis set. But let's start with simple idea of what this basis set is used for and, and, and what is it in general. So Technically, you can construct any wave function, doesn't matter how complicated it is for, for means what is your complication in the system, uh, this complicated wave function which describes your physical system can be simplified as a set of any functions, you know, from mathematics, from calculus, which is reasonable, easy to use. And just as illustration, as example, I'm showing this cartoon-like uh, file, uh, file slide. Let's say we have the targeting wave function of a system which looks like this car. You can see, it looks like a car. Uh -huh. So some special shape. It's a pretty complicated shape, yeah, because you can see there are many small details which not just single line or single function can be used to, uh, to describe it. So, Let's say we will use as a basis function some new functions, which we say easy style or easy shape functions, circles. You can see on my right side, uh, those red circles. So many, many identical circles can be used like this, to which together, if you have many of them, uh, to some approximation, you can recognize the shape of the car, right? Uh, Although you really need to have a good imagination to really realize that this is the shape of the car rather than the shape of the a hat, 
or I don't know what kind of other shape people we can become them here. So in other words, the accuracy is probably not really good, but we can improve the accuracy. Just in addition to big circles, we can add smaller circles. So our basis set will now include two types of functions, big circles and small circles. Let's see how this improves the thing. Yeah, now the shape of the car is probably better to recognize, not probably perfect, but for sure is more, that you have more details here comparing to the, uh, to the first case. Then the idea is simple. Let's take more circles. Let's take smaller and smaller circles. More complicated base to set. Now, the accuracy definitely improved. We have pretty good accuracy. And now you can really recognize the shape of the car with small details, even the window right on the top. Uh, the, the, the wheels have much better shape than they had before. So you really can recognize uh, that this pretty good image as it was before for our targeting wave function. So the idea is that we take simple wave functions and we take not one or two, we really need to take a huge amount of them and we probably need to take not just a single type of simple wave functions but several types of simple wave functions, put them together, we call it a linear combination in the semantical language, and all together they create this complicated shape of your initial targeting wave function. The simplification comes in the idea that you work with the mathematical functions which are well known, which are simple, means they don't have interruptions, they don't have breakage, uh, they are nicely behaved, smooth functions, uh, which is easy to work. Easy to work, you can make mathematical operations in an easy way, um, means you can take integrals, you can take derivatives in a very uh, clear way with these functions. So let's now go with mathematical language. How does this look like? So capital phi on, my, on the left side of this equation, this is my targeting wave function of a real system, of a real molecule in that case. I represent it as a sum over simplified basis functions, small phi, and phi, with indexes i means I have many of them and I add all of them together. And each of these wave function will contribute with a different weight or with a different coefficient. So let's now look on this equation in a more detailed way and let's call each of them. So if I go with my left side of the equation, this b, c, this is a wave function of a system, as we want to get, and this is unknown right now, right? This is our goal to figure out what is it. For this unknown wave function, we will be using known basis, simplified, simple, easy to work mathematical functions, which we know, many of them. By the way, we can use not exactly the same wave functions, they can be they vary in, in some sense, like big, small circles, right? So these wave functions can be modified, we can do several type of these wave functions, uh, but each of them will go with some weight or expansion coefficient, which again, probably not known, we have, the, when, when you run the calculations, these coefficients will be found out to minimize the energy of this wave function, means you find in these coefficients so that when you recalculate the energy of this wave function, so final wave functions, the targeting wave function, its eigenvalues would correspond to the lowest possible energy. And you already got the idea that we need to take really not a few basis functions, but many of them, which means that n should go to a large number. In, 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 in ideal case, it goes to infinity. So accuracy will grow with a number of, uh, with a number of these wave functions. As per, we call it a complete basis set. If you have a complete basis set with n goes to infinity, you get exactly the wave function you want. So the accuracy will be 100% accurate if it's a complete basis set with huge amount of them and going to infinity. Of course, this is not how we work. We cannot take infinite number of wave function. We just, uh, when we do the real calculations, we uh, take some big number, which would be big enough to be approximate, to be approximated to this infinite infinite number of n. 
Then the question is, how many basis functions to use? How do we know which wave functions and how many of them to use in a the basis? There are several logical ideas behind this. First of all, we can justify the quality of the wave function, as already mentioned, uh, means we can try different bases and then compare the final result for each of these big uh, phi, the actual targeting wave function. We can evaluate it with respect to its energy, <coughs> associated with each of these states. We call them eigenvalues, right? So trying several basis sets, you can figure out which of them provides a function with the lowest possible energy. And then this would be the right one, the good one, the best one. So then the lowest energy will be the most accurate. And you, another idea behind it, the more, um, I'm missing this word, you can help me what is missing. So the more the basis function uh, to the real one, the work which is missed is probably looks like, right? So the more it looks like the real one, if your basis set, if your basis function is already close in its shape, in its mathematical expression to the real one, then of course less number of basis functions is needed, which means your calculations will be faster. You get the accuracy quicker. So two ways how you choose this accuracy. One, intuitive approach that your wave function should look like your actual function. I think this is clear why we can use this parameter. And the second, not intuitive way, really have to do the calculations and then check which of them provides the lowest possible energy, or you can take any other physical parameters to compare with experiment to really see which of these uh, physical observables will be the best reproduced by this or that basis. Why is it critical? Why is the basis set is so important for us? So the basis set needs to be able to approximate the actual wave function as good as possible, sufficiently well, to give what kind of results we're interested in? Anyone can help me? Okay, then I will just talk with myself. Chemically meaningful results. Uh, or physically meaningful results. Again, these results on a observables which can be taken from experiment and directly compare with your calculations to get them something comparable, meaningful, which really have physical chemical meaning. So then what we need to do with the cost, for sure, we want it to be as small as possible. So we want it to be reasonable computational cost. Reasonable means short, right? If, if you can do it, with less time, computational time as possible, which means that since when you do these calculations, everything really about taking the integrals and solving the uh, differential equations, just taking the integrals at the end. So all these integrals should be evaluated quickly and accurately enough from a numerical point of view. Of course, these two approaches result on a kind of a trade, a deal, which you have always to think about. Because if you take very accurate, if you want to get very accurate results, it immediately means that you have to spend a lot of computational time. So probably you need to give up on high, high accuracy to make your calculations being done in a reasonable time. So this is our trade choice always involves a balance between accuracy and the computational cost, because to get really very good accuracy means you're probably not possible, it's not feasible to do such calculations because they require too much uh, computational resources. And then more accurate methods using larger basis set, of course accurate means larger basis set, will take longer or more computational time, computer time, computer resources. So we always need to figure out that, yeah, you cannot just take without thinking, let's take the largest basis set as possible, because in this case, you probably will be not able to get your calculations done because of the, especially for the big complex molecules, this will be not possible to do. So you need to get this trade all the time when you're working with, with computations. So uh, now about basis sets. There are two main uh, difference, different types of basis set. One is so-called 
plane wave basis functions, and the other one, atom-centered or localized basis set. And again, these two different types of basis sets we choose based on the material you are working with. So plane wave basis functions, they are plane wave, if you were taking uh, some math courses or physics courses, you probably know what is a plane wave, it was a mathematical expression of the plane wave, it would be exponent in a power, usually it's involving the imaginary power, i, and then I say, you know, variable x, ix, exponent, which is the same as sine x, cosine um, x, uh, from the trigonometrical functions, which uh, can be expressed as exponent or just as cosine and sine. So plane wave basis function is based on this trigonometrical functions like cosine and sine, or you can, or both of them, uh, both as exponents. So this type of basis functions, because you can imagine cosine, it's really spread over. It repeats itself all over the entire space. So this already involves the idea that your wave function has to be very delocalized, very spread. It's not sits on a single atom. It spreads over the entire system, which is the case of which kind of material you can think about where the electrons are spread all over the entire material. Metals? Deals with the conductivity properties. Yeah, it's metals. First of all, metals or metal-like behavior. Also, semiconductors uh, also can represent this. Uh, solid state semiconductors represent this type of behavior when wave function is spread over the entire system. It's very delicate. Um, if you work with conjugated polymers, or also they call semiconductor organic materials, they also, uh, this conjugation goes through the entire long, long, long polymeric chain. In this case, this choice of basis set is also reasonable. You can use this plane wave basis function. Although for chemists, we usually, if, if you're not working in solid phase, if you're not working with metals and semiconductors, then you probably work with small molecules, and this means that you need to take atomic centered basis function, localized basis function. We'll work for molecules. Uh, in this case, we use H-like orbitals, so H-like basis functions, which is, we know quite what is H-like means. This is a solution for hydrogen atom, which we can get accurate analytically. Uh, this is Schrodinger equation can be solved directly for the hydrogen uh, atom. And we can use this as, and we know from general chemistry and from more complicated uh, classes you were taking already, uh, this is S, P, D, F orbitals, which we can use as a basis for our functions. Uh, for our basis functions to reproduce a real wave function of a system of a molecule. So plane wave basis functions. Let's start with disadvantages. Uh, if it's spread out, then no problems, right? Because then, then this uh, sine, cosine like uh, wave functions looks really good and we can take many different sines and different cosines and we will be probably getting real actual wave function of the system pretty quickly. However, if you work with localized, with the molecules, where the orbitals, the wave functions is localized on the atoms and they not go far away from the boundary of the molecule, then you need to kind of get out to create a vacuum around molecule, yeah, to have a boundary for the molecule. In this case, it requires many, many, many plane wave functions to make a vacuum, to have no any contribution from the wave function on a space where the molecule is not there anymore. And this is a disadvantage. Your basis function, your basis set should be increased dramatically if you use this plane wave basis set for the localized system. Uh, also, for numerical point of view, there are no analytical integrals with uh, exponents of the sine and cosine. Uh, which makes these calculations being more expensive for taking some type of integrals. So, or it results on a numerical noise. If you cannot solve it analytically, then numerical solution of integ taking integrals through the numerical procedure usually results on some kind of noise, which of course reduces accuracy. Especially, again, this noise is the most pronounced when you have, uh, when you apply this basis set to the atomic, uh, to the, to the molecules, to the localized uh, structures. 
Advantages well described extended solid materials, metal semiconductors, conjugated polymers. Also, this basis set is a complete basis set, which means it behaves very logical in the sense the more you take, the more accurate uh, wave function you will get. And this is not always the case for other basis sets, which we will discuss later on. But with a plain wave basis set, if you want to increase the accuracy, you just increase the size of your basis set. Take this n goes high and high, and then you immediately should see the increase in the accuracy of your actual wave function. Now, atom-centered basis function. And I'm showing this S, D, uh, P, D orbitals. You can put them together, getting some new wave function. Of course, we're not using one or two, as already discussed. We need to have many of them to really create the good basis set. So advantages good for describing localized electronic behavior, such as in molecules, small molecules. Then you really need a few basis functions, not a big amount of them needed. Um, create pretty good uh, basis for, for accurate predictions on the reactions for most molecules. Also characterizing the type of bonding very easily for, for strongly bound, like strong chemical bonds can be described really very accurate with this basis. Also has uh, this basis that usually produce integrals which can be taken analytically, means we don't need to do numerically this procedure. You can use a database where all these uh, table integrals have been already taken. You can apply this without making any noise and also saving some computational time. Uh, which is, of course, a big plus. However, it has to be used for the very delocalized electronic behavior, as we already said, like metal semiconductors. Uh, also, have to be used for the periodicity if you work with solids, even if it's a molecular solids, but which implies periodicity of the system. Uh, this basis set becoming problematic to be used. So, I will be not spending time on a plain wave basis set anymore, uh, but we will be talking only about the localized basis set, right? And again, showing you the idea that if you think about small molecules, uh, it's very natural to assume that all molecules come from atoms, constructed from atoms. Each atom, we know the electronic structure, we know this you know, from general chemistry, how we go with stealing the electronic orbitals, starting with one S, then then it goes 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, and so on, so on, uh, f and even more, right? If you go uh, to heavy elements in the periodic table, then putting these atoms together, you can create a molecular orbital which will have the sigma nature or sp hybridized orbital nature or pi orbitals like in the, um, in the resonance rings for the conjugated structures. So this basis set is very logical to use if you know a little bit of quantum mechanics and a little bit of chemistry uh, from atomic point of view, then it's very natural to use this 1s, 2p, 3d shape orbitals to create molecular orbitals of the bigger, more complicated molecules. So let's go through a little bit more mathematics. Uh, I just, those who are taking quantum mechanics, uh, they should recognize this. Uh, a form of the wave function which you can get for solving Schrodinger equation. Those who didn't, but hopefully you took general chemistry, right, where something like this was maybe not shown in mathematical way, but getting overall ideas that your wave function of the hydrogen um, atom with one electron should depend on the position of the electron from the nuclear, R. Then it also depends on the, because it's a three-dimensional function, it depends on the angular uh, azimuthal angle, right, this set and phi, uh, this is angular kind of behavior, uh, angular momentum behavior of the electron in the three-dimensional space when you go from x, y, z to the spherical coordinates. So that, then you can break this function just represent as a product of two functions. One depends on just r, just on the distance, on the variable r, and the second part is the uh, angular momentum Part, which depends on this theta and phi uh, coordinates in a spherical coordinates. And actually, shape, S, P, D shape, is dictated by this Y, L, M uh, part, which depends only on theta and phi. But the distance, which again is dictated by 
also it's of course relies on whether it's SP and D, but it also relies on the um, N quantum number N, how, uh, which shell, how far away your electron is from the nucleus, and which cell, shell, one or two or three, and so on. This is mainly dictated by this big R, which depends only on the coordinate from the nucleus. So we call this yeah, solution of Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, big psi, 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 problems with Greek letters. Then big R would be, we call it radial function, which has information about the distance, right? This is our distance from the nuclear, nuclear, uh, nucleus. And then the spherical harmonic, uh, which, which is also uh, dictating the shape S, P, and D shape and angular momentum behavior of the electrons. So we know that this wave function should be orthogonal. Uh, they have a pretty complex form already. Uh, and you cannot really get it for uh, uh, the, the solution in this form is approximate for atoms having more than a single electron. Once again, a little bit more mass, if we really want to know how exactly this dependence on R what the function uh, is, is given as this dependence on R, this is a form of this function. So the capital, yeah, this is our radial function, which depends on the quantum number N, which is, means which shell you populating, uh, one, two, three, and equals one, two, three, and so on, so on, go further, further, uh, far, far from the nucleus. Then, and uh, yeah, L is the angular momentum, S, P, D, the shape, whether it looks like sphere, sphere, or like a, like a flower, D, or like an eight, number eight, for the P orbitals, and so on. So then we have normalization constant, which we need in quantum mechanics. This, uh, again, just mathematical procedure, how we normalize the wave function. We have a polynomial part, which depends again on a number n and l, on the quantum numbers n and l. And this is actually the most problem, problematic uh, part, which makes this mathematics very hard when you use the radial wave function exactly in this form. So exponent in a power, some constant r, where r is our variable of the distance from the nucleus, this is not very hard as from a mathematical point of view, R in the power L, L is the angular momentum, is also not hard, but the polynomial part, I even don't show how it looks like, it looks but a polynomial, right, you know, in some power. Uh, this is a problematic part. So because of this part, no one really using the actual hydrogen-like orbitals. Instead, they use a simplified form, so-called Slater-type orbitals. They don't have this polynomial part. The only part which is preserved is the normalization constant, and here I'm showing more complex, like the top of this, the first part of this, with a denominating, uh, um, uh, uh, numerator and denominator. This is the normalization constant. Then we have again this r in some power, n minus one, n is a quantum uh, quantum number, which you know, if you know which electronic level you're, you you represent, is it n equal one or two or three? You can of course take this power without any problems. And then exponent with some sigma or z, wherever this Greek letter stays for, is a constant. And then again, r is a variable distance divided by r naught, which comes from the normalization constant. And then multiply by this uh, radial, uh, not, not radial, the part which uh, is dictated by the angular momentum. So we get rid of this polynomial part. So technically, if you delete this uh, polynomial part and leaving only the one part of the uh, of the radial function, right, which, which has this r in the power and then exponential part, this technically not really a solution of Schrodinger equation anymore. It's a simplified mathematical function which was produced form from the actual solution of the Schrodinger equation. And this is what is called Slater type of orbitals, Slater uh, basis or Slater orbitals. Of course, if you just take a single wave function like this, it's not very much useful. You need to take many, like many of them, with uh, different uh, contribution from this zeta, from, from this constant in exponential side, uh, to improve the results, to make it more accurate, to be really a solution of the uh, 
uh, of the real system to reproduce the, let's say, before, if you use Hartree-Fock for the solution of your many body, many particle uh, molecule, then uh, many, many of, of this shape STOs, later orbitals, will reproduce the actual Hartree-Fock orbital with a good accuracy. And here is a show in the example how it can be represented. For example, for 1s electronic orbital, instead of taking actual shape of actual solution of Schrodinger equation for 1s orbital with the hydrogen, we reproduce it in the form of the slater with this anode, again, uh, is a constant, or it can be defined. Uh, and this zeta i goes from 1 to 5. So we put many. Uh, many forms of these exponents, at least five of them, right, to create this basis, to improve the accuracy. So using this basis in 1930s without any computers, uh, Hartley was able to solve, uh, to solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen just using this uh, atomic basis set, I mean, not atomic, the um, Slater type orbital basis set, to solve the, uh, the, the, the equation, the equation for the hydrogen, without any computers, just by hand, right? Which means that he was able to take all the things, uh, all the all the integrals he was able to take analytically, without numerical approaches. Okay. So advantages of the Slater type orbitals. It's a complete set, which means the more the better, right? So the more of them you introduce, the more accurate results you will get. Radial behavior close to the actual radial behavior of hydrogen-like orbitals, the solution for hydrogen atom. Uh, reducing the polynomial part, you reduce the mathematical cost for this, for doing this calculation, so it's easy to operate. However, disadvantages, there are no nodes which has to be present in actual real functions uh, if you really solve the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen. Um, they are not orthogonal anymore, and this is also a, a, a problematic for these functions. Um, and you need to really have a lot of STOs to get to the big, big molecules uh, to get them correct, uh, to, to do the actual functions. You need a lot of them to, to be introduced. So, which means it's a good solution, but not the perfect solution. We need to find a way to simplify this basis set even more to reduce the computational cost. So, how we can do this? Instead of STO, we can take a function which will be looking not very different from STO, but from a mathematical point will be easy. You can see it has this additional part with exponent now, not in the R power, but in the R square. An exponent in the alpha r square, alpha is a constant, we call it a Gaussian function. So Gaussian function is really nice, beautiful, smooth, well-integrated function, much easier to work rather than exponent in the r, the Slater type function. So, and it's not very different from the Slater, right? So we can use now Gaussian to use it to reproduce the Slater and then slated to reproduce the actual orbitals of the real many electron function. So kind of you taking a basis set for the basis, which will be used for the actual function. The basis of basis. Gaussian functions are used for the basis of the STO, which also used as a basis for the actual functions. So it's kind of a folded structure. So advantages, uh, because of the much better behavior of the Gaussian functions from a semantical point of view. Integration goes faster, uh, also we know the analytical solutions. So it's much easier to operate now if we use G GTO, which stays for the Gaussian orbitals, rather than just later. Again, the disadvantage pretty much the same, it's not orthogonal. Uh, if you really take a a small number of them, then the, then the accuracy will be very low because they're even not as good as ST1, right? So they behave not very good, especially close to the nucleus and far away from nucleus. So this is where the Gaussians are very different from Slater and from the actual wave functions, which again means that you have to take more Gaussian comparing to Slater. But 
the cost, even with more Gaussians, the cost will be faster than less STO because, because of nice mathematical behavior of these functions with respect to the integration. So let's now compare how STO Slater orbital compares to the uh, GTO, the, the, the Gaussian orbital. So the magenta is Gaussian, blue, dark blue is the Slater orbital. Here I'm showing just a single orbital, which again we know in basis set we're not using a single orbital. There should be a set, many of them, to go to contribute to the actual uh, actual function. But even with one, we can say that very different behavior near the nucleus, close to zero, where the electron is close to nucleus. So it goes too slow comparing to the Slater, and we assume Slater is more accurate because it's more close to the actual hydrogen-like uh, real solution for the Schrodinger equation. And the same happens at the end, but at the end it's a too rapid. It, it goes down too rapidly comparing to the blue line, comparing to the Slater, which again behaves more close to the actual uh, atomic um, hydrogen atomic like orbital. So what to do? One orbital is not good enough for, for, for the for the one GTO is not good enough to take to, to reproduce STO, you need to take a linear combination, a sum of them. So then don't forget STO is also approximation to the hydrogen orbital. So it's not an exact solution but better than Gaussian, right? So now if we take several of them, for example, here I'm showing the gray solid line, GTO1 means you just take in one uh, GTO, one Gaussian, same as was in the magenta, but I'm looking on a smaller, uh, smaller radius uh, range. You see how, how it's very different from the Slater, the dark black solid line. If I'm taking two, uh, two GTO, it's becoming a little bit better, but not very much. Uh, 3GTO is definitely improving. And then if I am kind of do some massage, normalization, and so on with this uh, uh, taking 3GTOs, then you can see that now it's always reproducing the STO orbital. So several, the linear combination of Gaussian orbitals can represent a single STO. And again, I need more than a single STO to reproduce the actual behavior of the actual system, the, the, the wave function of the actual system. So single GTO basis function has a significant error, which compared to Slater, especially near, near the nucleus and far away from nucleus. But if you take several GTOs as a combined linear combination, the basis function is greatly improved. And again, what's the difference between this STO3G in my notations in the, in the right, uh, right image comparing to just GTO3? Uh, STO3G has these coefficients which were already chosen to minimize the overall energy. And to, to the weight coefficients for each of the um, Gaussian function were already taken in the right way to minimize the error. So I'm just showing with this illustration that yes, although you're taking more Gaussian functions, you're not losing accuracy, or if you're losing it just by a little bit, very, very close to the nucleus, but you really gain a lot in computation cost. Taking three GTO in cost will be still simpler than a single STO. Okay, so then how this works? Well, each individual uh, Gaussian or GTO function, not very much useful, right? Instead, we use a normalized linear combination, a sum of several GTOs. Uh, we call them primitive GTOs, primitive Gaussian functions. Each of them contributes with a different weight coefficient, right? Uh, and uh, slightly different constructed Gaussian functions to reproduce this basis set. And again, we have this CI coefficient in front of the primitive uh, GTOs, the wave coefficients or the uh, construction coefficients, which will be chosen based on the minimizing the energy corresponding to this wave function. Several of these primitive, the linear combination of several primitive GTOs used to reproduce a single STO. And now we 
go to the notations which are used in the software, Gaussian software, which has actually the meaning for you, it's probably not very important, but it would be a good idea to know. This is the most common basis set, which is really the cheapest one, which provides pretty good accuracy, especially if you have only carbon-based materials. It holds 321G. This is a basis set. So again, don't forget, we have this STO basis set as general big, I'll say, as, as main basis set is STO, but each of these STO uh, include, include several uh, GTOs, several Gaussians. Several STO means that you have this exponential guys coming with different zeta, right? Because A0 is a constant, it's, it's, it's the same for uh, any STO, it will be the same constant, but zeta, this Greek letter, in, in front of R, uh, can, be, can vary. And with one zeta, it would be just one STO. If you change the zeta, let's say double, make twice bigger zeta, then it would become one with Z, another with twice Z, so you have two STOs and so on. So now, for basis 321G, 3 is the number of Gaussian functions, primitive Gaussian functions, which you use in the sum to describe the inner shell orbitals. Inner shell means valence electrons. So we have, for each inner shell, we have three Gaussian functions. Then two, this is the number of Gaussian functions you use for the STO, for the second zeta, when you use zeta and then double zeta, right? So this is two Gaussian functions to use the second zeta. Uh, and one, this is a single uh, Gaussian function used for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the next zeta. Let's say zeta plus some other constant. Each of these numbers really stays for the information how many Gaussians you use for each STO reproducing the whole basis set of the actual system. And again, 321G, I'm kind of putting it in a way that you can think that 3 is a primitive GTOs for the core. Uh, well, it's actually core, uh, core, not really core, but let's say in the border between core and balance electron, because sometimes it's not so trivial to define where the, uh, what really has to be called core. So, for example, in some cases, uh, if you have D and S, right, in 3D and 4S, 4S is the core or the valence electrons. You can, you can, depends. So this is three for this kind of core, which actually treated as valence. Then it's two primitive for the inner valence and one primitive for the outer valence. And you can break this in a, in a language of SP. And so on. This is a number of SPD which will be used in your basis if you use this 321G uh, for, for, for the molecules containing these atoms. If I want to increase the basis set, I can use 631G. In this case, 6 will be used total number of uh, primitive Gaussians for the all valence electrons, kind of, I call it core, uh, core to core, which kind of uh, put it in between core and valence then three for the inner balance, one for the outer balance. You for the second part of the, for the Slater determinant, which was now reproduced with several Gaussians. So once again, so 321G means that your basis set is based just on a two zeta, we call it double zeta. Zeta and let's say twice bigger zeta, or zeta with some constant. Triple zeta is based on the STO with three zeta contributions. Zeta, let's say twice zeta and three times zeta, three STO. And for each of these STO, you use different number of Gaussians. In one case, we discuss as two and one. For the other case, three is used for the Gaussian functions that for the first STO, right? Kind of same as was in the previous double zeta. Before it was two, now it's three, it's increased. Then you have one for the function in the second STO, and then in one Gaussian you use for the next part uh, in the set STO. So your basis set 6311G, of course, is much bigger now than 321G. What else we can do? Um, so 
three one like if you see the increase in one month, this means that you use more STOs, and each STO contributes additional uh, additional GTO. You might not really increase STOs. You can stay with this 681G, which means you still have this triple. Uh, uh, Three, three, three uh, zeta contributions to the STO, but this star means that you can add additional d orbitals to the p orbitals. Like atoms which do not have d orbitals, you still kind of artificially add the d orbitals to increase the basis set. Which this is the reason you can put star or you can put d in the parentheses. Uh, both notations are okay to use in a Gauss scan. So the idea of this is this slide. Uh, I'm trying to reproduce it with my shapes of this uh, p orbitals. So, for example, you use p orbital, right, as, as your typical basis set, contributing from 681g basis set. But if you add d orbital, it means that you kind of elongate the uh, the position of p orbitals. You 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 make this uh, p. You can, it still stays as a p orbital, but with a longer shapes. And same for the S. If you have only S type uh, atoms, like hydrogen, for example, it doesn't have P, it has only S. Then you add additional P, which is not there, but you can add it artificially to the S orbital, and then it becomes more polarizable, kind of, it extends a little bit longer uh, due to the contribution of the P. And this actually stays with this double, double stars uh, in, the, in the notations. Why is it helpful? It's not increasing the basis set in the same way when you increase more and more STOs, like 63111G. It's increased basis set by a little bit, but it improves the accuracy for such elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, very electronegative elements, which has this very big, uh, lone pair electrons. And if you are a chemist, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about um, for these electronegative electrons, right? So we have this. Uh, in general chemistry, some, some of the teachers also call them the, uh, the ear of here, of, of, uh, the, the here ears, right, uh, for the oxygens. So, as already said, to summarize, this addition of extra D or P orbitals to the same, without changing STO contributions, it's called the polarization functions, right? And uh, they are mostly important to add this addition. It's very important for the atoms such as oxygen, strongly electronegative, uh, uh, which has a very polarizable nature atoms. That's actually the name stays for. And to summarize all these uh, features, right? So here, comparison again, 681 GD or G star, adding this uh, polarizable functions. You can also use plus, which is goes in front G. This is diffusive functions. Instead of higher uh, higher orbitals, you add actually low orbitals. For example, for element which has P orbitals, you add additional S. To 3P, you add 4S. Uh, and, and, and this also helps, uh, helps to improve the accuracy without making the basis set as big as in the case of 6311 plus plus GTP. So here you also include, include STO, you, you, you have overall much bigger basis set due to the bigger contribution of different STOs, each of them coming with extra, extra Gaussian, and you also include the diffusion functions and the polarizable functions. There's another type, uh, this is called spotal basis sets, there's another more accurate and more complicated in terms of more, more cost efficient uh, basis set with this AUGCCPDTZ, right? I will not go to the details of this, but this basis set is another alternative to use in the same way as Popol's one uh, with DZ stays for the double zeta uh, with addition of all this polarizable and so on through a little bit different procedure. This is much more com uh, computationally, um, computationally costly, this Dunning done basis set or Achleric basis set. They are more costly than Popol basis set, but they usually provide much bigger accuracy. So if you really need, if you have small atoms, small molecules, sorry, if you have small molecules and you really need very, very high accuracy, 
I would suggest to use this AUG type of the, or TZVP types of basis set. If your molecules are really extended, big, you have more than 50 atoms, for example, and accuracy maybe not really such, such as a big deal, then focal type of basis set would be the best choice. So I'm stopping here, uh, and we are ready to get to the practical exercise. I know it's a lot of information. I suppose to talk much shorter than I was doing it. Uh, but with the practice, you probably get better idea how these different notations, 681 versus 6311, plus and this D or plus and star, how all these things are uh, working in Gaussian and how this actually affects the results. Okay, so I'm... Uh, uh, Professor Kilina? Uh, yeah. So, um, please do not stop sharing screen. Um, okay you have planned to assign a homework for next uh, monday would you please share bring it to your screen so that we all see it because it will, it will be our plan for today uh, to today's practice can you see it yes so it's only number one mm -hmm. uh, just let me let me make it bigger Okay, so here is, uh, but I can rephrase this. It's not really such a big deal. You, I can rephrase this question, right? So what we want to do now, we take the very simple diatomic molecule, such as the uh, HF, the... Hydrogen fluoride. Hydrofluoride. Yeah, hydrogen fluoride. And from, from the experimental knowledge, we know that it has the bond length, HF bond length is 4.917 angstrom. Just less than one strand. And the bond energy, I put it in the kilocalories, but you can, of course, convert it to the electron volts because Gaussian probably doesn't really provide the units in kilocalories. You have to do some transition to the different units, but this is the units on kilocalories for the bond energy of, the, of this compound, which is 141. Let me recheck it once again. I think it's correct. So this is experimental values. So our task is to do the simulations of this uh, diatomic molecule. We should go very quickly. And we will try not only different basis sets, but we also try different methods. And, but, and you were talking only about hot before, but you can, you can, you probably have heard about DFT, right? You will, and uh, we also uh, can talk about more uh, same approach as Hartley Fogg, but Jan Hartley Fogg, uh, including, including the many body kind of perturbation theory for the Hartley Fogg. This is called NP2 and NP4, many body perturbation theory up to the second term, perturbative term, or up to the fourth, even more, uh, more time consuming and more advanced. So I suggest to do together only first three Hartley Fogg, this relief, and NP2. So Hartley Fogg, you know Hartley Fogg, this relief, this is the functional used for DFT, and MP2, Jan hartley fogg uh, improves through the many-body perturbation theory up to the second term. Let's forget about MP4. Let's just do the three methods. For each of these methods, you will use three, uh, the, the basis set 681G, then you use 681G with a polarizable addition, DNP orbitals, then you use 6311 bigger with more STOs included, plus plus using the diffusion functions and also using more polar, uh, even more polarized, polarizable functions. D and F, P and D, right? Not D and P, but also F to the D and D to the P uh, atoms. So let's use this basis set and then make a table where you can put columns as your Let's say name of columns will be will be the basis set. A name of uh, rows, lines is your method or backward 
up to you how you create this table. So you can open the Word document uh, and create this table. As soon as you get in your calculations, you will populate the information of this table from your calculations. So for, uh, for each of these calculations, you need to get, after it's optimized, you just measure the bond length, this is simple, and put it into the table. And this, the second part would be a little bit stronger, to stronger means more, a little bit more complicated, more tricky to calculate the, the energy, the bond energy. How we will calculate the bond energy? You need also to run a single calculation of atom contributing to the molecule. It's hydrogen and S. With the same methodology, you're not optimizing, of course, how you can optimize them. The, uh, it's an atom, right? So uh, nothing, nothing to optimize except the wave function. So you run this, uh, this uh, calculations with these different functions and different methodologies just for hydrogen and for fluorine atoms, and then you subtract the energy of the molecule, HF molecule minus energy of H minus energy of F, and the difference in these values should provide you with a good accuracy the value for the, uh, for the bond energy, for the energy of bonding of this molecule, which you can compare with experiment, right? And then you can conclude which of these methods, which of the basis set, and which of this method will result in a much better, uh, much better bond length and much better uh, bond energy. Any questions for the task? Um, seems clear to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Janice, any questions? Okay, yeah, it uh, sounds like Janice doesn't have a question. Okay, you? No questions? Uh, Joyanta? Okay, Joyanta also doesn't uh, set up questions. So I do have uh, uh, the following suggestion. So I will start sharing screen and uh, we'll try, uh, we'll start doing this uh, little exercise um, and, uh, and asking Professor Kivina to stay uh, connected and uh, mm, watch what we are doing and uh, provide feedback. And, okay. Okay? Okay, so... But can I, can I get out? Can I not share the screen anymore? Yes, yes. Uh, you are stop sharing the screen. And I will start sharing the screen. Okay, but you can do it automatically, right? Yes. Okay. Are we not sharing the screen anymore? No, I think I. No, no, I think I am sharing the screen. I did a screenshot of your uh, assignment. But I don't see. I see only my screen. Okay, let me do it once again. Do it. And I have this, you know, images, image and image and image, and many, many of them, like a fractal structure. Uh -huh. This is the favorite part. Is it better? I guess I see your screen now, yes. Okay, okay, very good. So, uh, please uh, let me invite everyone to um, log into the Photon and make sure you're logging in with uh, the graphical connection so that one can um, use the um, Gauss View application. So I will type in uh, the command just in case, uh, as a little reminder, I will type it into the uh, chat room. And oh, 
also let me remind you the um, directory where we do exercises for the class. So, um, I did create a sub uh, subdirectory uh, for web number 15, and now I am executing Ghost, Ghost View. I know that uh, Janice and Joyanta are using mobile XTERM, and uh, you is uh, using um, Mac, which has some. Uh, um, challenges uh, with using graphical information so I, I will quickly create uh, a model with graphical mode and share it with you so that you can just uh, modify the settings for the uh, basis set so for and uh, if you are not speaking please mute the microphone um, so, I am going to go see you, selecting a new model, and in the periodic table, selecting the flooring uh, with one band, and then clicking uh, into the model, and then selecting hydrogen, and uh, clicking Okay, so the model is uh, has been built. Um, also, in order to have a reasonable starting point, one can. Um, well, I think it, it is it is fine. So uh, let me save. I'm saving the model. Um, without changing modification and we'll share it with uh, everyone so that you can uh, simplify so this uh, hydrogen for the com and here we are coming into the ambiguity so hydrogen fluorine by hardy fork method uh, okay now let me do, uh, control c Stop this. So you, um, okay, yes, uh, I see your comment. You can create HF with Avogadro, or you can copy uh, the, um, you can copy it from uh, my directory to save time on the um, file transferring. So after the model has been done, I'm looking for the uh, suggested table, so it uh, suggests that we use uh, the HF B3 loop MP2. Yeah, but this is methods which you have to apply one by one, right? Of okay, course, totally of course, yes. Probably can just go to message. Yes, just a second. Uh, I want to be organized so that uh, uh, the report is created as, as we go. And uh, since we have two, uh, the connection simplify. Uh, okay.
So for the, I'm going to Gaussian calculation setup. And right now I'm not doing the optimization of geometry. It can be uh, done uh, probably in, this, in a second run. Uh, so we keep uh, energy, then clicking on the method, it has uh, hearty fog, and then um, instead of this uh, 321G, we will go to the first in the list, 631G. And uh, there are no indices. So I will click uh, Submit and uh, save it with the uh, unique name. So one may want to assign uh, the name that specifies what was the method and basis set. So for the fog, with hard to fog, with uh, six. 31G. So then I'm going to save and it will ask for submitting this file to Gaussian. So and it is already uh, ready. So I can immediately look for uh, total energy, and uh, but the distance was not optimized, so it is not uh, um, so much uh, available. So I'm going to run the second calculation on the top of this and request optimization, which will uh, take uh, a little bit more time. So bring in... Uh, the job type from energy to optimization. And checking that uh, the parameters are the same. Hard to focus, 631G. Clicking to uh, submit and run this job save under different name, adding the uh, word optimize, so that we will be watching, we will be seeing optimized uh, geometry. And click in save. Submit the following to Gaussian. Okay, uh, it is immediately ready because it is very small molecule. Um, I do not see the second atom because they are aligned in the plane. Uh, perpendicular to the plane of the screen. And now after it is uh, optimized, I can go into the results and um, look for the total energy. Summary.
So the energy that we need is um, under the E brackets RHF. So it is uh, minus 99.9 uh, something in uh, atomic units. And uh, you may want to save this uh, number into the table. So if I want to get this number in the command line. I can uh, inspect the uh, directory. So uh, I'm using this grep SCF uh, to analyze Oh sorry I did I did uh, copy paste a different thing I will, I will do it So by uh, the word uh, grep means uh, extract the uh, line that uh, includes the certain uh, keyword and uh, I'm taking the last one if there is more than one. So the last one does show the value after optimization has been done. So here I'm uh, build, building the table putting And given the uh, energy in uh, atomic units. So returning um, back to, I will do one more and then browse through directories, uh, checking that everyone is uh, doing well. Um, Gianta, you do not need lots of software. You uh, just run mobile extern, uh, not, nothing, nothing else. Everything else is on the on the cluster. Okay, so selecting the one uh, which was uh, optimized and resetting, re uh, setting, uh, making the calculation setup. Gaussian calculation uh, setup. And yes. What was the block length for your? I, 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 did, I didn't measure it. I will uh, set uh, um, submit a couple of jobs and then then analyze one length. Uh, so another one is uh, hard to fork with um, basis set. V one one G. Okay. And for the okay. job test, no, 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 631G uh, and then DP. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, with this new settings, I need to adequately represent the uh, basis set in the name of the file. Otherwise, otherwise it will be a mess. G. D. P. and underscore OPT for optimization. Then clicking uh, agreeing to submit to Gaussian and it seems uh, ready at uh, no time. So opening it And checking if the total energy was uh, affected. Results summary. So I do see in results and summary that uh, the energy did change. So uh, instead of uh, minus 99, it is minus 100. So with a larger basis, the total energy decreased, which means the molecule becomes more stable. And if uh, energy becomes uh, smaller... No, no, no. Uh, no? This is not really uh, appropriate for checking which one method is better, because what is really important to for absolute values of energy, they are not very much useless. You, uh, they are useless. <laughs> but, but, but the difference in energy would be really important. Yes. Because when you change the method, your reference, like for energy, everything is depends where you choose your zero. And the way how the zero can be chosen automatically, it's done automatically by the program, it might vary depending on the methodology, depending on your basis. So, which means that actual value not necessarily can be comparable because in one case your zero is at minus 10 atomic units. In the other basis set, it can be taken minus 15 atomic units. So, that's why not absolute value has to be compared. But if you subtract the energy of each individual atom, which was calculated also at the same level of methodology, with the same basis, with the same method, then this difference would be really to compare. Very good. Uh, hi, on the homework, could you show us the homework again? Because I remember the second basis is not this one. Yes, I put uh, I put, put a little bigger basis. Yes, it is. Uh, so you should do different thing. It's uh, six. Six sixty one G. Yes. Uh -huh. But we, we, we are making it right. So let's make it six eighty one one G D P. And then the last one would be six three one one plus plus G, and then double stars. Or oh, it's D F three D F three P. And again, you probably don't see increase in your computations because the molecule is so small. But you probably can 
keep an eye for how long it takes to do these calculations, especially when you go to the more advanced methods, such as MP4 or MP2. In more advanced methods, the difference between bigger bases and smaller bases, the difference in the time of calculations will be more pronounced. Mitri, what you're trying to do? So you're trying to make a different basis? No, 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 just uh, saving, uh, saving the file. And uh, let me check if uh, everyone is on the same uh, page. <coughs> 